everyone welcome uh welcome back to the hermius podcast uh we got a a crew here for you today we're going to talk a lot about uh you know, additive 3D printing, if you would, and why that might be controversial later. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but as far as intros, uh, Glenn Case, uh, founder, CTO here at Hermes, you've all heard my background before. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to our guests here today. Sam? Hey, my name is Samuel Kelly. I'm the additive manufacturing engineer here at Hermes, and I'm the guy in the back who prints stuff. And I'm Matt Karish. I'm actually from Velo 3D. And, uh, Technical business development um, manager, uh, do a lot of work with Hermius uh, and working on 3D printing. Uh, and I am Jordan Fisher, senior propulsion engineer here on the engines team and a proud user of all the additive technologies that we're developing in house. Well, awesome. So when we get into this, I just want to, you know, kind of wrap our heads around, you know, what exactly is you know, uh, you know, additive or 3D printing, right? There's a number of, uh, or the layman's term of 3D printing or metal 3D printing. Um, you know, so which one is it? Is it additive or is it 3D printing? Personally, <laughs> on my approach, I like to say additive for industrial uses because everyone's almost everyone's heard of a 3D printer. They think of their little Ender 3 or their Prusa. And so whenever I say 3D print things for a living, people think I just have a fleet of little plastic printers. And they talk about <laughs> their cousin's uncle who's got one. And it's, it's great. Don't get me wrong. I have several at my house and there's one in the back corner of the factory. But <laughs> what we do in additive, especially with metals, is a, quite a bit different. Oh, it's much more of a science than a, you know, kind of like tinker toy. I think you can go like pick one up. I, I remember the first time I could go walk into a store and physically buy a plastic printer was just a transformational thing. And I think it was still like $1,000 back then. But I was like, wow, you can make small little trinkets this big in my house? That was amazing. The last printer I bought, I bought brand new in box for $98. Oh, man. It's, <laughs> things have changed I, for sure. I think something that I found in the industry, like when people ask me what I do and I say additive manufacturing, if people aren't familiar, mm -hmm. they're like, what? What question mark? Like you make additives for what? Like you put them in <laughs> liquids or food or what? Like, no, no, no. Let me back it up. I do 3D printing with metal. Right. I'm like, oh, okay. So it's it's almost uh, how familiar are you with the technology? Mm -hmm. uh, depends on what term you use or kind of defines what term you use. I think. Right. That's fair. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So. I guess, you know, we're, we're all, you know, we're, we have this aerospace company here in Hermes that has leaned quite heavily on, you know, additive. Um, you know, we manufacture a lot of parts that probably couldn't be made or either we don't have time to make them conventionally. But uh, there's a number of reasons that gets me excited uh, from day to day in terms of what additive has to offer. But I'm curious to hear from you guys, you know, what what gets you up in the morning? Um, what gets you excited about additive? I might get to let some others answer this, but for me, especially with what we've been doing recently, is we bought printers. We don't necessarily run out the, the full production phase. We're very close to it. We're trying to figure out what we can do. So the first thing we do is we bought all these new printers, and then it's immediately pushing the absolute limits to learn what we can and can't make. And then we pass off that data to like the engineering team to see what kind of things they can do and go wild with it. Yeah, I would say uh, starting to work on our additive manufacturing capabilities has enabled me to push the pace of the iteration that I'm doing for my designs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I had a concept that I'm not really sure is going to work physically or interface with the hardware that I'm going to make, uh, traditional manufacturing methods, you would have to go source the billet, maybe wait. You know, if it's on the shelf, you could get it freighted over two or three days. Um, but if you have to wait for the billet, it could be weeks or months and tens of thousands of dollars to yeah. get just the raw material. And then you have to subtractively manufacture that, turn probably 80% of it into ink canal dust. Yeah. And then from there, you've you know spent four months getting a prototype. Whereas you know every single week I can go with a new prototype to Sam and say, hey, can we try this? Can we see if it works? And then at the end- Build that confidence that you yeah, can actually yeah. manufacture it. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, that's the thing. When I was a young man like Jordan, um, I, uh, you know, I didn't have that luxury of being able to you know, send something off and, and have it, you know, the next week or, or whatever, you know, I was like, Hey, we got to get a casting. All right, let's start planning a year and a half ahead for, for this part. And it becomes a really big thing when you have to put all your eggs in a basket of one or two iterations for a casting. 
Um, you put a lot more engineering effort up front, a lot more analysis creates that analysis paralysis, right? And um, the, the ability to iterate quickly and not have to, you know, be so beholden to one design really is liberating in terms of the freedom to design and frankly to fail and learn. Yeah, there was a, a term I came across, I think at my time at GE was fail fast. Mm -hmm. And it was a kind of a buzzword term where, you know, not everyone's okay with failing still. Um, so well, if failure is definitely an option, you fa that is the wrong, like as long as you're not, you know, safety is never a question here. Life and limb, always safety first. Yes. Uh, but uh, mission assurance, definitely take risks. Fail. Right. So it's like if, if from my perspective, if you're not failing, you're not pushing hard enough, you're not trying, you're not learning. Right. And like, I mean, earlier today we saw the call it the boneyard yeah. of what you guys are doing back there. That's but absolutely my favorite area too, by the way. It's just, I, every time we walk back there and uh, you know, that people might, most people might shy away and like, don't look behind the curtain. Yeah. For me, it's, uh, it's like, Hey, you want to see where we screwed up? This is really cool. Yeah. Okay. I there, had a series of parts I've actually been making for Jordan and I actually yeah. have like five fill plates and it's an, you can see it get taller and taller and taller every time <laughs> until it's final part. <laughs> well, especially the DED uh, stuff that we're doing with the laser. Well, we'll get into that in a minute, but man, those, some of them look like a furry beast from little, you know, pigtails hanging off of it and wires hanging off of it and just some stuff that would, you know, just kind of make you scratch your head sometimes. But the amount of learning we got out of that um, just by seeing how it worked and trying things is pretty amazing learn something new every time so i'm actually looking forward to after this starting one more build to see how good i can get it yep. and i think what's what's awesome about it from a velo perspective when you guys are off kind of pushing our technology and breaking it to some extent it helps us figure out where we need to get better and having that really good collaborative relationship with folks like hermius allows us to to take your learnings back in Velo and then make our technology be able to do bigger, better, more reliable, more repeatable things that allows you to get, you know, the parts you need better, faster, stronger, whatever it needs to be. Right. So, you know, I guess that's a good point of departure. So I guess in terms of Velo, tell me a little bit more and tell the folks at home a little bit more about what's what's special about Velo, what sets you, uh, you know, apart. Um, I've certainly got mine that I'll key off on uh, here a little bit, but I'd like to hear from you first of, you know, the, the your company's stance on, you know, what makes you the best? Sure. So I think to to do that justice, you have to understand where Velo is coming from and uh, kind of some advantages that we had more or less just by the fact of when we started. So Velo was founded... Um, approximately 2014 by Benny Bueller and his motivation, his whole motivation for founding the company was as he was going around industry, he kept hearing about all this added manufacturing stuff and this huge promise where people weren't able to deliver and live up to that promise. Mm -hmm. So his whole op op opinion and, and position was we should go make additive actually go do these awesome things that people are saying it can do like that that would be awesome so velo was born to go solve all these issues that what we refer to as legacy additive manufacturing companies um were struggling with mm -hmm. so we have the advantage of having seen everyone else's failures and if you having will a clean sheet design exactly and so we took if if you look at our system compared to many other systems out there, there's a entirely different approach to how our technology is just manufactured mm -hmm. and, and how we approach additive manufacturing. And again, that's, you know, partially having the advantage of coming in late and, and knowing things that we need to go address. So from the start, putting in a ton of metrology and uh, being very attentive to how we handle our gas flow and um, how we handle our powder, those types of things. And there's a, a bunch of little things I can pick out about our technology, like our non-contact recoder um, and our uh, kind of in-process monitoring. You know, we could talk about for days. But I think at the end of the day, it's when all those different little tidbits come together and this technology solution that we offer that allows folks like you to more or less plug and play with the technology. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you're gonna, you know, 
plug it in like a, a CNC <laughs> mill and, you know, start cutting chips day one. What, like, this isn't Legos? <laughs> it's a magic button. <laughs> Press it and get a part. Yeah. But, you, you know, it. the whole goal is to lower that barrier to entry right. and, and not have you guys be PhD experts in right. laser powder bed fusion uh, to be able to generate parts and, right. and want you guys to focus on the things we do best. Exactly. Hypersonic. Uh, design vehicles. of parts. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, you know, I think the thing that really sold me the most and, and keying off on what you said there was, you know, all the metrology, the things that, you know, Velo has put in the technology that they put into their machines has created consistency. I think that's the biggest thing for me. And that so much consistency, I think one of the things that really blew me away was that the, the, the material differences between parts and geometric differences between parts printed on multiple machines in different locations across the United States. And you compare all of those and the, the, the differences are just minuscule. And that gives me confidence that, you know, when we go and develop a part here locally, when going into quote unquote production uh, and we need to, to increase production capacity and send, you know, those that, that digital file out, it's not requalifying that part on another machine, which we've had to do in past with other manufacturers. It's no, literally, you're sending that file over and they're using the same powder, essentially. And then, boom, you have the same part and you don't have to really worry about it as, as much as you would have in, um, you know, other other folks. And that that's an incredible value add for for us, at least not having to qualify two parts. Yeah, I, I think we're seeing that resonate massively with the customers we've been working with for a little while mm -hmm. who are starting to get into that mode where they're producing quantities, not just one offs, and they're having to deal with multiple printers. And um, honestly, I don't even think we realized the benefit at Velo mm -hmm. until some of our customers started pushing that envelope. Mm -hmm. And then we were like, wow, you know, this is just a product of all the little pieces we put in. But it's arguably one of the most valuable things that our technology. I agree. Brings. I also think it's one of those things that's going to be required uh, in the future as you know, um, additive is sort of adopted in your traditional aerospace umbrella, right? If you're going to try to qualify something to part 25, um, that that's a big different story uh, of talking about raw properties versus, you know, printed properties. Um, you know, uh, I guess what, what are the, what are the challenges you think you guys see in terms of, you know, what needs to happen so that, you know, you can adopt these things. You can see these things on Hermes, uh, you know, Halcyon uh, in, you know, the next decade or so and flying people from one place to the other. Uh, that, what, what, what do you think needs to happen there? For me, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, it goes back to your point of consistency, right? Like, it take away that we're doing additive manufacturing um, put in any manufacturing technique to be able to be qualified and call it like a regulated industry, mm -hmm. FAA regulated industry, you have to have consistency, repeatability and reliability. And okay, so great. Now plug additive back in, how are you going to do that? Right. And a lot of it just goes back to the fundamental approach we've taken to additive manufacturing where we're using the same process parameters. We have all of our in-process monitoring our automated calibration so our machines are running very consistently over time. It's not a burden to go requalify or recalibrate. Um, that's everything that exists today. And then probably new for everyone here is we are working with some folks like NASA to, I'll say, gear our technology to be uh, qualifiable, certifiable to things like NASA 6030, and those types of specifications where, again, lowering the barrier to entry, someone like a Hermes could just pick up the technology and then everything you would need that, you know, those specifications are calling out key process variables and um, process controls and all that stuff is very well laid out in our technology. Right. Whether it's through process specifications or how we're kicking out our um, Assure build reports and all the process monitoring type things where you don't have to go dig through the data, do manual recording, manual measurements. We're using the technology that we have to spit all that information back out for you. Yeah. And, it, and nothing's really going to replace the coupon either, right? Of just printing a coupon and verifying that you have that 
Um, but you know, just the, the, the understanding that you have high confidence that that coupon is going to have the same properties as, you know, the part that you printed as well as what you are expecting to get out of there in the first place and just get into that MMPDS level of, uh, you know, B, you know, A or B basis allowables is, is going to be a big, uh, big thing. Yeah. I think, uh, increasing the times that we can apply additive, uh, parts into our actual testing and, and get to a point where we're predicting the performance. We're not just testing until it fails. We could actually, you know, go to the analysis and say, okay, well, this part is going to fail after X number of cycles, and then we'll need to take it out of service. And then that being right and increasing the, you know, population confidence that we have on the application instead mm -hmm. of, you know, staying limited to those development parts where it's okay if it breaks when we're off prediction, you know, we need to get more reliability in there, more yeah. confidence. Yeah, I think one of the more interesting things for me is, you know, the you know, compared to rot properties, you know, your ultimate yield strengths are pretty comparable, right? When you process it the right way. Um, the the more interesting thing there for, you know, like part 25 adoption is fatigue life, right? Now where it's, it's really kind of finishing too, um, that there's some studies out there that it's just like, hey, uh, unfinished 3D printed, you know, um, uh, surface finish is more of a crack initiator, uh, clearly, than something that's been cleaned up. And you can really improve the fatigue life by just cleaning up the outside or bead blasting or doing things like that. And um, but you know that that's the that's one of those things I think with the adoption of it is like how can we make those surface finish improvements painless and easily repeatable in terms of fatigue life but for aircraft that hermius is making though you know at least for the first few aircraft we're not expecting a 30-year <laughs> lifespan on the 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 airframe right uh, it's you know especially for quarter horse you know it's dozens of flights right so we can it's more rocket bit like than it is aircraft like so we can tolerate a lot of those um you know makes qualification a good bit easier too absolutely absolutely you know you don't have to test as many cycles it's cheaper <laughs> i think that shows that there's benefit in the industry partnership so when we're going to work on applying velo technology to making our parts then we could feed back the data to velo and say okay well this part works for our development application but it may not work for high cycle fatigue and then we could improve and fine tune the process parameters so it's more repeatable so mm -hmm. in parallel we're doing the applications development and they're doing the fundamental development and sharing that data makes the industry better as well yeah and we're and we're actually doing that right now right uh you know in terms of reactives and titanium you know uh, you sam you want to talk a little bit more about what the powder stuff we're doing with them yeah we're actually having our own parameter set that we're working with velo to create and implement doing like things like larger psds to eliminate some of the environmental hazards and to make what what is a big, what is a psd you know, it's a psd so <laughs> for the people at home metal uh metal powder <laughs> printing basically it's your particle size density a really conventional especially for powder bed you're looking in the 15 to 45 microns range which this is an industry where everything's <laughs> metric so i can't really yeah, convert I've, over too well so for everyone at home i'm a big fan of freedom units <laughs> I think, you know, this, you've probably heard me give the joke about, you know, there's only two types of, uh, there's only one type of country that's been on the moon and it was, you know, basically <laughs> in freedom units or something like that. Some, some joke like that I just butchered, but, uh, actually I'm a big fan of unit diversity, you know, because if it's just anything that you can count on like two hands is probably the right unit. So if you take like BTUs in your house, how many BTUs and you divide it by, you know, it's a British thermal unit, right? Not quite American. So not quite freedom, if you would. Isn't it crazy that America is the country that's using the British thermal well, unit? Well, yeah, and, you know, uh, France. They use the we, metric said, system over We there. gave France the double fingers. That's what we said when, uh, when they decided to go to the system international. But um, anyways, the uh, if you take the number of BTUs, so, like, you know, we know how many BTUs it takes to heat and cool a house or so. And if you turn those in from British thermal units to American thermal units by dividing it by 1776... Become something that you can measure on single hand. So I, I support the ATU. I love that. You've been working yeah. on that one for a while, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, it's good. That's good. excellent. But uh, you're back, welcome, everyone. Back to the powder. So <laughs> a conventional, <laughs> a conventional, you know, powder size like 15, 45 microns. We're actually doing some custom processing, going to bigger powders, which is nice. Cause several different things. It's reactive, especially titanium. It's no longer classified as a hazardous. It's still 
flammable, but it's not a hazardous control material at larger particle sizes. That also means when you're making these powders, the stuff that you're sifting off that you don't want, these extra big powders, they're actually cheaper. They're easier to get. So it's kind of been a win-win for a lot of us in a lot of different ways, trying to go to a bigger powder. And working with Velo, they're able to make you know custom parameters, and we can say we want to emphasize fatigue or this or certain tensile strengths, and we can really cater and develop parameter sets around that. And it's been really great to work collaboratively. Yeah, and I, th I think the other piece we're doing with you guys is working to do that parameter development, but having you guys take the coupons and go do all the characterization for us because you know what you need to characterize, what data points to test at, stress levels, temperatures, those types of things, and then sharing that back with us. So it's, it's a really good partnership for us um, as well. Mm -hmm. Excited to see coming out. We actually have, I believe, the first meter tall titanium system you guys are working on, at least in the small um, non-XC sapphires. Yeah, first reactive meter tall sapphire. So that'd be fun. Yeah, I had to approve a PO to dig a pit over there. Yeah, it's... I'm hoping it's not my grave. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ho, ho, I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, you know, 3D printing's additive is great. Um, it's enabled a lot of different things. It's probably not the silver bullet though. Like, so what? What are the what are the things that, uh, you know, the problems? I can I kind of speak to this one. So. I'm an additive guy. Before I was an additive guy, I was a CNC manual machining guy. It's where my first you know, degree was. My first few jobs were in machining. You can't just press go on a printer and pick a part out. There's always going to be other stuff going on, be it removing it from the build plate, supports, or heat treatment. So yeah, processing. You've got to think of that early, early on. So it's like a design for manufacturing, and you can't just pick up this part. you got to think, how am I going to clean this up? If this is a geometry that can't be able to be machined, well, then how am I going to get to these internal supports? You get into a lot of weird niche things, and it's funny. It's actually a lot of technologies that were before additive, back in the castings, aerospace world, that almost died off, and then additive has a resurgence, like stuff like chemical milling. So mm -hmm. that was something that was getting pretty, pretty rare. And now, especially with additive, especially with small touch points and tree supports, where chemical milling is a really interesting thing, a lot of flow honing. And you got to think of when you're making a part, when you're printing a part, how am I going to support this part? How is it going to be used and how can I get those supports out? Yeah. Yeah, I think we we also understand probably just as well as anyone that additive is not a replacement for machining by yeah. any means. Uh, we actually look at it differently. Uh, we have a, a pretty strong network of contract manufacturers um, who are basically companies that run our technology and will make parts for people. Um, and when we go looking for contract manufacturing partners, we first and foremost look for really high quality machine shops mm. who don't necessarily have any additive experience, but know how to make parts right. and machine really good, high quality parts. When you add, <laughs> no pun intended, ah. additive technology to that type of shop, it's this incredible combination of technologies where right, force they can multiplying. exactly they can print these really complex structures that have all this kind of internal complexity, but they will still need machining on that part to finish it and create a final part, um, which most additive parts are not run of the mill, you know, turn a bar, right? right? You need to be really good at machining to be able to machine additive parts as well, because they're generally complex. I've never, outside of a challenge coin, I don't think I've ever kind of, you know, just printed something and it was, not, even our challenge coins aren't print and done. It's they, finishing. There's but, some <laughs> little bitty supports in there. Yeah. And they're very tiny. That just makes them even harder to remove. Yeah, but no, it's just like, I've never had an additive part. I mean, I treat it more like castings, right? I mean, it is very much a good, um, you know, uh, analogy for a, a, a casting, right? You have, you kind of want to print some datums in a little bit so that you can actually hold it or work hold for the things that you want to, you know, machine on. Most things need to be cleaned up or threaded or, you know, trimmed or something. A lot of interfacing flanges, especially with roughness and surface roughness 3D printing, we can get pretty decent functional parts on like flow path, but any kind of interfacing Mating ceiling edge yeah. still does need to be machined threads 100%. all types of stuff like that but you can do some interesting things like you, you mentioned print in datums mm -hmm. you can print in uh quick disconnects if you need to mm -hmm. do airflow checks or you need better access to certain passages things like that so you can use the additive technology to enable your traditional subtractive technology as well that's right. So, uh, Jordan, you know, in terms of you being an engineer, and I know how it's changed me, but how has, you know, additive kind of changed the way that you engineer? 
Yeah, I think especially here coming to Hermius where we're bringing the technology in-house, it's a lot of it is the cycle time. So mm -hmm. where we would have to get a part and get it machined, wait for it to get machined. Um, especially this is something that you told me when I was very early on here um, from your experience building the first round of the engine. Um, sometimes it, it's just faster and quicker to start from powder instead of starting from a, a huge block of metal. Yeah, um, well, I can confirm there's the nozzle flaps on the seed round. We're I designed those things to be, you know, three axis, two op machine work. And uh, a lot of the shops are like, oh, you want to machine that out of 718 and a little bit of a plate? Yeah, that's going it, to just the, it was faster and slightly cheaper yeah. <laughs> just to print it. <laughs> Yeah, I would say I didn't believe I didn't believe you until I started designing my own parts. <laughs> and obviously you have to change your design methodology to support it. You have to right. bake in other processes like post machining. Right. Um, but then I was like, OK, well, I'm going to do the direct comparison and send out a uh, quote to what I can do at uh, part additive and what I could do uh, part conventional machining. And then the guy goes, OK, well, well, how much time and how much money do you have? And I'm like, I, I think we have a we don't have that much time, but we, we have a decent amount of money to get this part done. And he's like, OK, well, it's six months, a quarter million dollars. I'm like, well, I, n we don't have that much money. <laughs> um, so we, we ended up editing that part because it was just a ton of, you have to think, pocketing, pocketing, mm -hmm. but with a, with a smaller tool. 718 is not fun to have yeah, machine. I can, I can definitely tell yeah. you that 17, 718 is well, not Well, I fun. think it goes a little bit further than that, right? So you yeah. know, we, we have an aircraft that is full of you know reactives, titanium, and Inconel, right? And so when yeah. you look at the traditional you know, fly to buy ratio of about 10% on aerospace products. That's a lot of chips. That's all. I mean, yeah, you're recycling some of that, but that's not the same rate that you bought it. And uh, that's a lot of money that you could save. If even if, you know, we can save on quarter horse, there's some millions of dollars we can save per airframe just by going from 10% fly to buy to 50%. Right. And that's just this, and that's, that's not a big lift when you're talking about additive. We're an additive. You could really, you could probably get in the neighborhood of 80, 90 percent, you know, and just kissing the yeah. Just Now, granted, there's a throughput issue associated with, you know, powder bed fusion when you get great surface finishes. Right. Uh, but the you know, the actual, you know, pounds per hour that you put down is a little bit. That's an interesting calculation, actually. So we don't just have powder bed fusion here for metals. We also have our like wire DED, which is directed right. energy deposition. We actually did a calculation. We were trying to make some part. I can't remember what it was. It was a few months back. It was cheaper to buy just raw wire because it's just off the shelf 45,000 welding wire. It was cheaper to just in the raw material aspect to buy wire and print it than it was just to buy the billet, not even counting machine time or toolings <laughs> or anything like that. That's great. And you're making 20 times the layer thickness. So Right. Well, that, you're, you know, you're just coming back and kissing it. And so that, I want to, you know, for this 3D printing, and I know it's, you know, maybe outside of powder bed, I do want to maybe talk about a little bit about DED and what we do here. So, Sam, I don't know if you want to take away there. So, yeah, that's the thing, actually, I've been working on. That's It's been a bit more of a project because DED is one of those things that the industry has gone for a lot for powder bed and making things, you know, accurate and you know as details as possible ded has been kind of seen as this it doesn't necessarily do things as finely detailed so we're going to put it not as priority so ded is kind of where powder bed to me was 10 years ago whereas you're having to get your own solutions three or four different solutions and then combine them yourself so we're currently working with a we have a six axis robot in the back with a two axis positioner and it's a multi o head so basically it's a ring of six low power lasers, fairly low power lasers, feeding wire through. And so I've been kind of playing with that. It's, it's pretty interesting to see the sort of stuff you can do, and especially the interpolations. I've got to admit, whereas the parts that come off of powder bed or cooler, it's cooler to watch the robots run because everything's twisting <laughs> in all sorts of different ways. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the big difference there is that it's speed versus surface finish and accuracy, right? So a it's, little bit of know, material properties, too. Yeah, a little bit of material properties because it's essentially a big weld. It's not. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, we do use a laser wire, which is probably a little bit better than, say, a you know a MIG or TIG type, uh, you know, fusion uh, type weld process. But uh, you know, certainly, you know, you're talking the difference between what 0. 0.1 pounds per hour for for powder bed to 10. I'm not sure the exact numbers, but we're working with. The Velo standard layer height is 50 microns. Our Multio system, their standard layer height is a millimeter, so 
20 times layer height mm -hmm. really and when it comes to properties honestly the size has been the hardest part because the number one thing we can't control is stuff like or can't it's harder to control stuff like atmosphere and having an inert chamber it's a lot yeah. easier to inert a box on a, say a 3d printer that's this wide this tall versus a room you walk in right right so i have a question for you then yeah what's <clears> up? are you guys interested at or have you thought about using ded on top of printed parts laser powder bed parts we've thrown about using ded on top of like machine parts but not powder bed printed that'd be an interesting thing to kind of see what interfacing i'd be curious to see what the mix of properties would yeah be. It, it'd also probably be dependent on the application right of just you know something that would require both you know but I, yeah, I see a world where that could be a thing i've Why seen, not? seen some parts out there that people leveraging the feature resolution of laser powder bed for, yep. you know, the intricate stuff. And then maybe for a larger manifolding or right. that type of stuff where you don't need the resolution, you just want to lay down the metal, mm -hmm. uh, come back and do that with DED. Right. So really interesting combination of technologies. I yeah. think. I've talked to some shops about not uh, DED on top of additive parts, but on top of conventional parts where you have something that's pretty close to a stock shape or some simple features that need to be machined out. And then from there building out uh, something that's increasingly more additive. So something with a plate, a couple mounting holes or something that you want to go in and build like a pad up off of. You don't want to print quite that whole thing. You want the good properties of the plate and it's easier to get. And then you could build features from there. I could think of some of your parts that'd be good for that. And it's something I haven't done, but I really would like to try actually. Yeah, the, try I I think we're we're gonna dial in the regular parameters first, but after that, some of the parts that I have are actually gonna be You gotta walk before you can run. Pretty pretty good for that. Yeah. I do wanna key off on one thing that we started to talk about a little bit, and you were talking about the um, you know, the the la the wire associated with that being cheaper, you know, for the entire part that's finished. Uh, compared to, you know, just the raw material that you'd have to bring in. I think that it goes a little bit even further beyond that in terms of, you know, we talk a lot about in the additive world of part consolidation. So you can put a bunch of parts into one part. You know, you don't have as many, uh, you know, things like injectors, right, for rocket engines right now. You, instead of having hundreds of parts, I mean, I've had injectors made that had 400 smaller injectors than a, you know, three or four other different, you know, manifold parts, right? So you're just have hundreds of parts that you can consolidate into one, right? I think there's another dimension of the consolidation and that's on supply chain. Um, so instead of, you know, having to have a two inch plate by, you know, 10, you know, 144 inches by 72 inches and I need a two inch plate and now I need this X, Y, or Z. Now you're like, I need this wire diameter and maybe a couple of different flavors of uh, alloy or this powder and in a couple of different flavors of alloy. So you really consolidate your supply chain. Those types of materials end up being cheaper than, you know, the, the things in more readily available than specialty plate materials that you have to go get a mill run for. Um, so I think for us and just reducing our risk, and we've had this recently in just one of our, plate orders pushing out to the right and man if we were just printing all those parts we have the we have the wire and the powder here we could do it but um but yeah no it, i think it underscores the importance of you know not only part consolidation but supply chain consolidation I, th I think it gives yeah it gives you a lot of power in simplifying your supply chain from that perspective the other piece that we're starting to see uh is the scalability mm -hmm. right so like you guys being able to develop print files, build files here, yeah. go vet them out, test them, right. make sure they're good. And then maybe you do, maybe you don't want to vertically integrate. You have the the uh, IP, if you will, the, the print file, which contains all the laser instructions. You can then go immediately scale your supply chain to contract manufacturers who have the same printers mm -hmm. and expect the exact same results coming exactly. out, back yeah. off without any capital. Investment. Anywhere in America. And it mitigates schedule and financial risk on, on our side as well, because if you need to go get a billet that's, say, 24 inches in diameter, and that's going to take six months to get it, well, you better know six months ahead of time that <laughs> your part is going to fit inside that billet. And what right. happens three months in when the requirements change? Right. Well, now you've got a incredibly heavy and expensive paperweight, and oh, you got to yeah. go get a larger billet. 
Whereas if you're doing additive, you can say, okay, well, if it still fits in the print volume, then I can still make it out right. of this, you know, set of powder or wire that I have. That's right. That's something fun I've been actually recently messing with on metals and some of our powder printers is you have this part and say, we only have currently operational one of the four machines Velo makes. Um, we're having more online soon, but we have this part and I can see those drop downs of what if I threw it in this bigger printer? What would this do for us? And it's been one of those things where you can either find a contract manufacturer that has that printer or in the case of our plastic stuff, just buy one outright because we don't even know, you know, we can already see our parts are going to work for this. We can already try it on our smaller printer. We know this is going to scale for us. So it kind of makes it a bit more easy to de-risk going bigger. Uh, and, and like I mentioned, you know, once you have that network, you can print it, you know, anywhere, of course, for us in America, I guess for others, maybe abroad, but you got to keep it in the good old USA here. But um I guess let me get, d dive into that a little bit and, you know, like what are some of the benefits here? I think one of, for us, you know, we're, a, you know, an Amer obviously an American company doing, you know, national security, uh, building products that help us with the national security initiatives here in America. Obviously, ITAR, we can't export things. Um, but having, you know, a, a vendor of 3D, you know, or additive machines right here in America where we can go to their headquarters or get, you know, you don't have to re rely on a satellite, a satellite, you know, office to come and help you has been incredibly important to us and a lot more responsive, frankly. And you can talk to the engineers and they speak English. Yeah. Time I mean, zones. For, yeah. for me, I'm, I'm American. So it yeah. <laughs> makes me proud, right. Yeah. That we're bringing what has traditionally been a call it European based technology, mm -hmm. uh, into the country. Um, it allows me to live 30 minutes from Hermes, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's very easy for me to come visit you guys and um, have a really good connection with all of my customers here. Like you said, we can directly support ITAR stuff, um, get involved with DOD type proposals and, and government type work. Um, and our support, I think, is what people feel the most is, you know, when you call we are on the same time zone mm -hmm. if you're in the US, obviously. Um, and we've got people all over the country. So you're not waiting days or weeks to get, you know, field service engineers out here, um, which is huge. And especially for a smaller company that's up and coming, we, we kind of live and die by our reputation. And a big piece of that is how well we support our customers. Yeah. So, you know, being very responsive in, in all aspects is, is critical to our success. Yeah, I tell you, I couldn't tell you how many times um, that in previous lives that uh, we'd have a big machine that we're installing or uh, and then, uh, you know, the only service people that could service it are, you know, Italian or German. And all of a sudden you're shutting down the entire machine shop or, you know, putting big tarps up so they can't see anything into the, to what we're doing. And oh, by the way, it's like, OK, well, we got to wait for them to get on a really, really slow plane and get here, <laughs> which is also annoying because we're trying to make really, really fast planes. <laughs> I know at my previous job, I actually worked for another printer OEM. I was in the U.S. doing research, but they're based out of Europe and getting on the 5 a.m. calls when everybody on the other side is already, you know, halfway through the day after lunch. And you're just waking up to try to get these service calls to get maintenance or something done or having a problem with the build file and you can talk about it. You can't really share what you're talking about, but you can just kind of you can't visualize anything. You just got to mm -hmm. talk. I've got this part that might have this angle. I can't show it to you. You can't see it, but you got to fix it anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah. And yeah. then imagine you have an issue at 1130 AM and then you have to wait till the next day for someone to address yeah. it in any way. There's That's a little the bit worst. of that fellow cause you guys are mainly West coast. So if I have an issue at 9 AM, I'm not getting a response till noon, but <laughs> it's a lot better than the next day. Yeah. Clearly you don't have my phone number yet. No. <laughs> that's probably that a, good a good thing, thing for you. <laughs> yeah. You should probably keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all I had today, guys. Um, you know, it was awesome. Awesome. Talking to you guys, uh, it is one of my favorite subjects and certainly one of the crown jewels that we have here at Hermes. Um, you know, n not that we don't have a lot of crown jewels, but it's a certain, certainly an attractive, uh, um, subject to be talking about but I appreciate you guys coming on and until next time um, follow the Hermes podcast thank you